So we're pleased to have Stefan Fenner or something close to that. <laughs> I got permission to say it a little bit wrong, or I think I got a little bit of permission to say it a little <laughs> wrong um, at the uh, Vienna University of Technology. And this talks about a mystery group action, an important implicit cyclic seeding phenomenon for a standard young tableau. Thank you for the introduction. Um, thank you for the possibility that I can talk here to you. This talk is based on a joint project with Per Alexanderson, Martin Ruba, and Joachim Ulin. Um, and I will only present the combinatorial ideas behind it, but not and talk about um, the representation theory that's behind it. But if you read standard Young tableau, you should always think that there's also some representat representation theoretical ideas behind it. But I will start with something completely different with some nice combinatorial objects, namely non-crossing perfect matchings. You can see one of them depicted here. So we have uh, the numbers one up to two n in this example, up to eight in a circle. And we draw some chords such that the chords are non-intersecting. And we always only combine, so we pair them up in, in pairs of two. So this is what we call a non-crossing perfect matching. And if you look at the sets of all the non-crossing perfect matchings up to a given size, so with two vertices, we only have one guy here with two, uh, with four vertices, we get two different ones. With three vertices, we get five different ones. And many people maybe already recognize the numbers. These are the Catalan numbers. So we have some combinatorial objects, we counted them, and then we want to consider Q analogs. We want to deform all of the integers into a polynomial, and we do that by replacing an integer n by the polynomial one plus Q plus and so on, plus Q to the power of n minus one. And if we plug in Q equals to one, we obtain back the original number. So this is why it's called a Q analog. And then there's the Q analog of n factorial, which is just a product of the Q analogs of one up to n. And then there's the Q binomial coefficient. And note all of these uh, objects here are polynomials in Q. And when we plug in Q equals one, we get back the object, but without the square bracket and only get back the round brackets. So we can consider the Q analog of the Catalan numbers. This is an example of C3, a nice polynomial. And then we can do something that's a little bit mysterious, a little bit crazy maybe. We can plug roots of unities into this one. So we start with counting formula. We constructed a polynomial out of this, and now we plug complex numbers into it. Here I want to plug in six roots of unity. So let's take the primitive root of unity, plug it in. And here we can see that this, these three terms will cancel. And then here um, they will also cancel. Here we get a zero. And if we plug in the square of this one, you can do the numbers, you get a two. Plugging, plugging in the second root of unity, so minus one is quite easy. Um, we get also an integer there and this continues. And plugging in the first root of unity, this is just plugging in, in one, we get back the Catalan numbers. But what you see here, we have some integers there. So as combinatorists, we ask, what are these integers? Now let's do something different. We had our matchings, our non-crossing perfect matchings, and they are nice diagrams. So we can simply rotate them. So this is one non-crossing perfect matching. The first label was here. In the north, so here was one, and rotating simply means rotated by 60 degrees, and we get this matching here. Rotating twice will give, give us this matching here, and then for the objects of size six, we have a, six, a, a second orbit, all of them mapped here in the circle. And now let's count the number of fixed points of rotation. So rotating only once gives us no fixed points because each element is mapped to something different. Rotating twice, this matching is mapped to itself, and also this matching is mapped to itself. 
But here in this orbit, we don't have any fixed points. Rotating three times, all elements in the right orbit are fixed points, but none in the, in the left. And we can do all the other numbers. Rotating six times is the same as rotating, not at all. So all elements are fixed points. And we can see these numbers match up. So this was my meme. I promised some people already there will be a meme. So this is not a coincidence. This is actually something that you can prove that this is true. And what you just observed is an instance of the cyclic sieving phenomenon. For this, in general, the ingredients are a, a set of combinatorial objects, then a cyclic group, like the group generated by rotation acting on our set. And we have a polynomial and a primitive n fruit of unity. So the n that's the uh, gives us which root of unity matches with the size uh, of the cyclic group. And then the definition by the cyclic sieving phenomenon, or here is a typo, um, by Rainer Stanton White is that a triple is said to exhibit the cyclic sieving phenomenon if what we just observed is true. So plugging in the powers of roots of unity into our polynomial gives us the number of elements that are fixed by powers of the action of our cyclic group. And of course, if you just have some um, orbit elements or some group action, you can always construct a polynomial by just interpolating. But the phenomenon part is that it's really often a Q deformation, a Q analog of the counting formula for the set of your objects. And what you just observed, at least in the case n equals three, is that the perfect uh, matchings, the non-crossing perfect matchings together with rotation and the Q analog of the Catalan numbers exhibit the cyclic sieving phenomenon. Um, that's for the cyclic sieving phenomenon itself. What's quite interesting is that even if we don't have a finite cyclic group, but just have a set and a polynomial, we can check whether there exists an action by a cyclic group so that we can complete um, a CSP instance. So a triple that exhibits the cyclic sieving phenomenon. So for this, we just have a set and a polynomial such that if we plug in one, we get the cardinality of the set. So this can be any set with this cardinality. We want to have primitive roots. We want the polynomial that evaluates to integers when we plug in um, powers of the primitive root because the polynomial is supposed to count fixed points. This is of course a necessary condition. And then a theorem by Alexanderson and Amini states that there exists a cyclic group of order n so here the n again matching up with the order of the primitive root. Um, so there exists a cyclic group action such that we get an instance of the cyclic sieving phenomenon if and only if a certain sum evaluates to non-negative integers. And here in the sum, we have these fixed points. And here we have the number theoretical Möbius function. The only thing that you should know about this Möbius function is that if you plug in one, you get one. And then the other possibilities is that it's one, zero, or minus one. And with this knowledge, what you can do actually, you can take your favorite set, whatever it is, you can take your favorite counting formula for it. You consider the Q analog, and then this with this theorem, you can simply check, is there some cyclic sieving phenomenon involved? And this is what we did for the set of standard Young tableau. So I guess most people of you know what a standard Young tableau is. So I will just explain it with a picture. The first ingredient for a standard Young tableau is a, an integer partition. So here's the integer partition 651. It's a partition of 12. And we depict it in a, in a Young diagram. This is, we take six, boxes in the first row, five in the second row, and one box in the last row. And we draw this left justified. 
So we get this nice diagram and then we can put some labels in there and we want to fill precisely the numbers from one up to N here in this example from one to 12 in a way such that if we go from left to right and from top to bottom, the values are always strictly increasing. So this is, is a standard Young top law of the shape given by the partition 651. So this is the set we want to consider. And now we look at the counting formula. So this is the famous hook length formula. Let me explain it here. The number of standard Young tableau of a given shape is n factorial divided by the product of the hook lengths of the cells. And a cell in a standard Young tableau gets a hook length. When, let's look at this example here. This cell here has the hook length consisting of the two boxes below and the boxes to the right and the cell itself. This gives us the hook length eight or hook value eight. And to get the number of standard Young tableau, we take n factorial and divide by the product of all these hook values for all the cells in here. And now we take the Q analog, so square brackets around everything. Then we need to cheat a little bit. We need to get an additional factor here, a power of Q, but this should not bother at all because when we plug in Q equals one, this, this vanishes of course. And this is a nice polynomial. Unfortunately, this does not evaluate to non-negative integers. It does evaluate to integers when you plug in roots of unity, but not necessarily positive ones. But what we can do, we can simply square the problem and say, okay, let's consider the square of these polynomials, F lambda squared. Then we need to take um, the pairs of standard Young tableau of the same shape. And then we can check using Alexanderson and the Mini that indeed there must exist a cyclic group actually. What's a little bit sad is, and this is the mystery part, that we can only prove the existence, but we cannot provide explicitly the group action. And as I have two more minutes, I think we can have a little bit of a look at the proof. So we need some more objects which are the border strip tableau. They look a little bit similar to standard Young tableau, but now we don't have single cells, but some longer shapes, which we call strips. Um, to, they, they have some rules. And also from left to right and top to bottom, there's some incremental conditions. So it also increases similarly to the standard Young tableau case. Here, the strip length is three. So all these shapes have size three. Um, and if you would consider border strip tableau where the strip length is one, we would get back standard Young tableau. There is a second example of strip length four. And what's quite nice, if we look at the polynomial and evaluate the roots of unity, we get precisely the number of border strip tableau of the same shape with a certain strip size up to a sign. This is some case of the famous Murnaga Nakayama rule combined with some results by Tony Springer and Pack. And what we actually proved that the number of border strip tableau for a fixed strip size is large compared to the number of border strip tableau where we consider strip sizes that are multiples. And if we know this inequality, there are some exceptions, some shapes where this does not work, but then we can do a case by case study. If we know this inequality, we can simply take it. We can also square it, it's still true. Then we can fiddle in our F lambda, evaluate it at roots of unity. Then we can plug in the Möbius function because I told you, you, you only need to know that mu of one is one. This, there's one. And then here, it's either one minus one or zero. So this inequality gets even stricter. Then we take everything to the same side. And then now we can apply this result by Alexanderson and Amini and get our desired result.
But now I want to point out again, it's still open to find this mysterious group action. This is where I want to stop. Thank you. All right, let's thank the speaker. Do we have any questions? I have a comment, maybe just quickly, mm -hmm. uh, that I've always been really curious about the cyclic sieving uh, phenomenon that it appears like quite in a few places that I've looked at. And I, I just think that you made a really good explanation of it. It, it really uh, enlightens it for me. Thank you. So I guess I, re oh, sorry, Lily, why don't you go ahead? <laughs> oh yeah, no, I was just wondering um, if you're doing this for standard Young Tableau, is there anything mm -hmm. that uh, you can get for like shifted shapes or semi-standard shapes? So actually it's true for skew shapes as well. Okay. But then we don't have a nice um, interpretation in terms of representation theory. Okay, yeah. Um, so that's why I only usually present the, the straight case, but it's also true for SQ case. Thanks. And we can also precisely characterize when we don't need to square. So, yes. Mm. Yeah, so I, I guess I just, I mean, I know you said you don't know what this group action is, but I still want to ask, like, based on, I don't know if you've done any, like, computations that have given you hints or like if you've made any progress in this direction but do you do you imagine that this is something that you may be able to figure out or do you think this is going to be like a super super hard thing to try to understand oh we actually want to understand it but we think it's super hard so because i can tell you something so if the shape is a hook then we can give a nice action if the shape is a rectangle, let me jump to the theorem again. So rectangular shapes, then the action is actually promotion. And this is a famous instance of the cyclic sieving phenomenon, which is proved by Brandon Rhodes. So there's a paper by Rhodes that says the standard Young tableau and F lambda, if it's rectangular, then promotion is the action. Um, but promotion already is quite complicated, so at least I think I won't be able to find it. <laughs> cool, thanks. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, it's very strange to me that there's this result that you're citing that says that there exists a cyclic group action mm -hmm. and, and like how could the proof of this work without like finding it it seems very strange that there, this result is even there saying oh, that yeah. you can have this condition guaranteeing the existence of an action and you don't have no idea what it is yeah so you can always construct one that's not explicit whatever an explicit group action is but let me jump to um an appendix slide. So if you want to revisit the problem of counting fixed points, if you want to count the number of fixed points, actually what we can do if we just look at orbit sizes, um, then we see the fixed points of rotation to the power of k is actually precisely a sum over all the elements that are in orbits of size. Oh, I, I see, okay. D. This is, yeah. And then you just need the Möbius inversion and then you, you kind of get that these numbers here should be the numbers of elements in orbits of a certain size. So if you just take any set, then you can arbitrarily build up orbits by saying, okay, let's take the first O1 elements, put them into one orbit, and let's take the next O2 elements and put in, make another orbit out of them. And then we simply group them together and then can say, okay, the group action now is the first element is mapped to the second one, the second one is mapped to, to the third one. So we can list all the elements in our set and then get in a group action, but this is something I would not call an explicit group action. Right, so it's kind of like when you know that two sets have the same size and so there has to be a bijection between them, but explicitly yes. writing down what the bijection is can be very hard. 
Yes, exactly. So there is, this is maybe the, the philosophical part, what is an explicit bijection, but I hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm. Well, it looks like our time for this session has expired. So let's go ahead and thank our speaker one more time.